Uh, hello there, can everyone hear me at the back? Yep, great. Okay, well, I'm a biologist, um, so uh, one of the advantages of that is that there'll be no equations in my talk, so hopefully you'll understand it. Uh, we'll see as we go through. And today I, I want to share with you about bacteria. Um, and, and the first question is, what, I what are bacteria? What is a bacterium? Well, this is a bacterium. It's a single-celled organism. And what I'm really interested in is the thing in the middle, the, the DNA. And hopefully you'll learn a little bit about, some, uh, about that today. Okay, so why should we care about bacteria um, is my first question. And my first answer is because there's a lot of them. Uh, five million, trillion, trillion bacteria, something like that, uh, on planet Earth currently. And particularly interesting for us is that a lot of them are actually inside you. So your average guy, uh, Bob, let's say, he's made up of around 30 trillion human cells. But within him, within Bob, we find there's actually 38 trillion bacterial cells. So technically, he's more than half bacteria, at least on, on a cell count. But the bacteria are quite small, as you probably know, so they only weigh a total of 200 grams. So we care about them because there's, there's a lot of them, but there's not just a lot, but they actually influence us in all kinds of ways. And there's lots of studies that are coming out recently about the connection uh, with health. So lots of different things, our immune system, various diseases, um, and lots of um, supposed links between the bacteria in our gut and our health and how we live. But I'm particularly interested not just in bacteria, but how they change. So this is the, the study of evolution. And evolution, um, first up, is this, this big picture um, idea. So it's the tree of life. <coughs> but it, it's not just uh, the big picture, it, it's also the process, uh, or it's, it's a process. Um, I, I think um, the wrong slides are actually put up, but I'm not sure if that's changeable. Maybe I'll put um, anyway, so this is the, the, this is the, the main process in um, evolution, um, is the process of natural selection, and that's uh, how nature weeds out variation, which we have. Um, so there's variation in nature. There's in this case, there's different colored insects. Um, but, it but nature can, can sort through that variation and produce change in the population. So you see that the distribution in the population uh, changes um, over time. So it starts that there's a few green bugs, but if predators tend to select those, then there'll be fewer over time. And that's just evolution. It's a change in the population. And... Okay, so in general, it's changes in populations, but you can particularly change, um, or you can particularly study it in bacteria. Um, and, and the way that, um, one way that this has been done is in terms in, in flasks. So this is on the left. Uh, it's a very simple system. It has some uh, culture, um, some material for the bacteria to grow in. Um, and if you transfer a small amount uh, for one flask, the next flask, and the next flask, the next flask, every day for thousands of days, um, then you can see a lot of change over time. And this is one major study that's been done. Um, and we are going up um, the y-axis, we have fitness, so it's basically a growth rate. And along the x-axis, we have the number of generations. So this study has now actually gone for 70,000 generations. This was just part way through. And basically, all we see here is an increase um, in the growth rate. <coughs> And particularly interesting in bacteria, or particularly important for us, is um, the study of antibiotic resistance. So when we uh, use antibiotics to try and kill the bacteria, um, this changes again, uh, as before with the bugs, um, this changes the population. Um, so if we, particularly if we don't use enough antibiotics, uh, there's a few, there's some that are still remaining. Some of these could be um, the ones that are remaining will tend to be more resistant. Um, over time and in, in different circumstances, you can get uh, a huge growth in antibiotic resistance. And this is, this is a, a huge issue um, for health at the moment. So people are saying it's the next apocalypse, uh, or it, it's the next pandemic, it could be the apocalypse, um, worse than cancer, all of these really um, severe headlines. 
But it turns out we can actually, it's, it's not just this kind of theoretical threat, but we can actually observe it. Um, so if we, if we start with this, um, so, okay, so firstly, imagine a Petri dish. Does everyone know what a Petri dish is? It's just a small plate um, with gel in it that bacteria can grow on. And one study that's been done um, at Harvard University uses a huge Petri dish, which is the size of a large table, so it's three meters long. Um, so this is the Petri dish. And at either ends, uh, you have bacteria placed, but bacteria can't grow in the middle because of antibiotics. But over the course of a few days, you can actually see the bacteria starting to grow into the antibiotics, and that's because of evolution. So there's genetic changes in the system that allow, um, that allow the bacteria to grow. And over the course of a few days, you'll actually see it cover the whole, um, so I don't have the picture here, this um, but it'll cover the, the whole uh, table-sized plate. So this is the, the process of um, antibiotic resistance in, in real life. So evolution is a big picture, story of life, uh, it's a process, natural selection, but it's also observable. And one of, th one of the um, results, or one of the results of this process is um, how, anti how antibiotic resistance actually occurs. Um, and it occurs uh, by what's called a trade-off. So quite often when you when you become more resistant to antibiotics, uh, you, you lose something in the process. So by gaining an evolution, you quite often lose. Evolution is quite often a, a short-term, uh, easy fix kind of process. And this graph just shows that m the vast majority of mutations we know that cause resistance actually also cause a decrease in fitness um, for, the for the bacteria that are involved. So most of them are on the left of this this graph rather than the right. And I just want to quickly explain to you how this happens. Um, and it happens, this, this trade-off process, imagine a car. Um, so it's a very complex machine, it has all kinds of parts. Some aren't necessary in some environments but are in others. Um, so if, you're, if you want to drive the car through a desert, there's a bunch of things in there you probably won't need. You can chuck out the heater and it'll be fine. Um, but then if you move into a cold environment, you'll want that heater. So this is kind of what happens in evolution. Um, the easy fix that makes the, the car more efficient will, will quite often happen. So um, just through chance events, the bacteria will tend to chuck out the stuff it doesn't need. And yeah, so this, happen, uh, this happens and this means that the car is less fit ultimately, which results in this kind of situation. Okay, um, I want to quickly talk through one specific example of this. Um, and this is uh, how some different, um, how resistance antibiotics uh, occurs with different antibiotics. Okay, so one um, important antibiotic is called streptomycin. It's a kind of aminoglycoside. And it turns out that the way that um, resistance to this antibiotic occurs, um, involves something called a proton motive force. So we've got to start at, the start at the start with the structure of the bacteria. What's around the outside of the bacterium? Anyone? A membrane, sure. Okay, so this is basically what we've got here. Um, and across the outside of this membrane, um, a lot of processes can occur because of a chemical difference across that membrane. Um, and it turns out that different antibiotics use this chemical difference. This is called the proton motive force. Um, in order for that, okay, and one, so the streptomycin uh, requires this difference, and it gets pumped across the membrane, so it gets pumped from outside uh, to inside using this proton motive force. So resistance to this antibiotic tends to happen by reducing the proton motive force. Um, that's fine, but most other antibiotics actually require, um, most other antibiotic, um, resistance actually occurs by pumping things outside the cell. So um, different drugs uh, like penicillins can be pumped out with the use of the proton motive force. Um, so if you use both, basically if you use both of these drugs in combination, uh, the bacterium has a real problem. 
because in order to try and adapt to one, it tries to reduce the proto-motor force, but in order to adapt to the other, it needs to increase or use the proto-motor force. So the moral of the story is if we understand evolution, uh, we can actually um, prevent it happening or limit it or kill the bacteria much more efficiently. So using two drugs at once um, is a trick that we've learned um, by studying the kind of mutations that happen in evolution. Uh, so in conclusion, um, if we really want to understand these processes um, and survive um, the, the, the growth of the superbugs, it'll be a really good idea to understand bacterial evolutionary genetics. Thank you. was on the right slides. Um, so th um, I, th I think the, the best solution is just understand these processes better. So if we understand how the bacteria are adapting to our antibiotics, we can actually use the right combinations um, and, and prevent most of the problems that way. Yeah, well, um, some people are saying that, but th there's huge kind of debate within. I, I yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think we'll be fine if we understand, um, if we understand the processes and, and use them carefully. So, if we use them um, more t in a more targeted way, at the moment they're kind of just given out quite quite uh, generously. If we use them together in very specific combinations, then um, we can kill the vast majority of the bacteria. There will be some that will be resistant and won't be treatable, but I, I think that won't increase significantly if, if we're careful with it. That's, yeah, that's my take. Yep, there's one at the back. I don't think so, un unless they're, they're transferring it to you. Yeah. Um, so everyone has their own gut microbiome, and um, I don't. I don't really know how much of that is, is, is transferred. It just depends how close you're getting to other people, I guess. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. Just as far as possible, probably. But. <laughs> <laughs>